Tonight's study is Finding Purpose in Problems, lesson number seven, and it is a continuation from last week's lesson in which we talked about having right thinking. And so I'd invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to Galatians chapter six this evening. Mr. Hander Outer is coming around. Oh, great. Thank you, Kevin. And if you didn't miss this wonderful three-piece suit that Kevin's wearing this evening, I just hope you don't get an injury and have to go on injured reserve or something. So, But nice Patriots uniform. We appreciate that, Kev. Galatians chapter 6, verse number 7 and 8 is where we'll start off from tonight. Word of God says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall reap the fle reap of flesh corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap everlasting life. You know what's pretty amazing is the machine inside your skull that we call a brain. Did you know that there's more information in between your ears than the whole library of Congress's 17 million volumes? You know what that does for people like me? It gives me hope because there's a lot of info in there. The only problem is getting it out. Maybe I need a better filing system to do so. But it's pretty amazing that that little machine in your head only weighs three pounds. How does that compare to all the volumes inside the Library of Congress? You know, as I mentioned last week, scientists tell us that each person has approximately 10,000 thoughts per day. Again, I find this encouraging. You know why? Because I've got a 1 in 10,000 chance of having a good thought actually today. Those are pretty good odds. I like those. 1 in 10,000. You know, in 1952, speaking of thoughts, a book was published that became very criticized because of its psychological claims. The author was a man by the name of Norman Vincent Peale. He made some lofty claims about being changed if you would just think the way that you are supposed to by being positive. Perhaps you've heard of the book, The Power of Positive Thinking. Here's what the forward says, and I just took a little bit out of the forward. Faith in yourself makes good things happen to you. This classic guide of self-esteem and success will help you learn how to break worry. Get people to like you. Avoid the jitters of daily work. Believe in yourself and everything you do. Develop a power to reach your goals and so much more. It's almost as if we could even insert, and it can be all yours for $19.95 plus shipping and handling. Can we take this thought of the power of positive thinking and actually compare it to Scripture for a moment? What about Jeremiah 17, verse 9? The heart is deceitful and all above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? We defined that word heart last week, not as the organ that pumps blood, but rather your inner man. We can even call it this, your mind. It is deceitful and above all things desperately wicked. Who can know it? No matter how positive you think about that, you're not coming up with anything good. What about Ecclesiastes 9 verse 3? This is an evil among all things that are done under the sun, that there is one event unto all. Yea, also the heart of the sons of men is full of evil, and madness is in their heart while they live and after they go to the dead. I realize that the book of Ecclesiastes is probably not on your happy, happy joy list, but it is what it is, and it says what it says. As far as the heart, the mind, the inner man, being good so that we can just think positively about him, what do you think the Bible says? <laughs> the power of positive thinking isn't going to change your life. Now, it may make some adaptations which could be considered a good thing, but that's not the way to change your life. In fact, there is no method, there is no formula, 
There is no system that can guarantee your success because you have positive thoughts. Because the problem is not your brain. It's your heart. You know, Norman Vincent Peale in his psychology book are totally misdirected. Whether you're saved or not, your heart prefers wickedness over spirituality because it is broken by sin. It's an inherent problem that you have in your thoughts by nature at the start because you are fleshly at the start. And no self-help book is going to fix that. Last week we studied having mental problems. And I know when I use that terminology, most of your minds go right to mental illness. That's not what I'm talking about. Rather, I define mental problems as a problem with wrong thinking. The Bible, as we saw last week, we just covered three specific areas about thinking, and we called them anxiety, fear, and worry. But we saw that the Bible specifically claims that these are not mental illnesses. They are bad choices in your mind. However, such a claim deserves some discussion because it's something to acknowledge what the Bible says. And if you have taken our lesson from last week and look at the scriptures that we have poured through for last week, and you say, okay, I struggle with anxiety, I struggle with fear, I struggle with worry, but I choose to know that God's word is true about these topics. And when he says, be anxious for nothing, or fear not, I'm going to understand that God's word is true. There seems to now be a disconnect on how to implement the word of God into your life so that you are practicing it. And I believe that disconnect is a major one for many, many Christians. What I find is that many Christians want to do what is right, but they don't know how to implement God's word so that it changes their behavior. And so the purpose of this lesson tonight is to very quickly arm you with principles from the word of God that will give you a way to change your thinking. If your problem is anxiety, fear, worry, or whatever other wrong thinking that you have, you can change that thinking by implementing three biblical truths that I want to share with you tonight. And so my proposition to you tonight is this, and maybe you understand this. You are what you eat. You are what you eat. No, that doesn't mean that tonight Kevin is a chicken. It doesn't mean that I am an edamame monk bean pasta. What is that? You don't want to know, okay? Doesn't mean that Dan is a hunk of tofu. Sorry, Dan doesn't eat tofu. That's me too. But I want you to understand this principle. The way that you change your thinking is the way that you change what you put into your mind in the first place. You are what you eat. And so what we want to do tonight is we want to show you the laws of Scripture that will give us some ways to change our thinking. So number one is the law of sowing, and your blank is you reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. We just read Galatians chapter 6, verse number 7. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. This is the law of sowing and reaping. The mind is like a farmer's field. If a farmer plants corn, when it comes harvest time, what is he going to reap? Corn. If a farmer plants wheat, what will he get? It would be absolutely ridiculous for a farmer to plant corn and expect to have a wheat harvest, wouldn't it? Whatever you plant is what you get. And so if you sow to the flesh, guess what you're going to reap? Corruption, a sinful life. It is impossible for anyone 
who sows to the flesh to reap spiritual benefits that are pleasing to God. So God has given you the ability to control your mind and thereby what you will harvest in your actions. If you'll experience defeat over sin, lack of power, or never really able to get in touch with the fullness of God, it's because you have not sown the right materials into your mind. Now I realize, again, I say that there is no formula. This is a heart relationship with the Holy Spirit. Uh, let me just say this for a moment. I'm not saying if you do religious things, you will glorify the Lord. Because frankly, we're not talking about religion here. There are people all around the world that do religious things that are good. But the path to hell is paved with what? Good intentions. It doesn't mean that it glorifies the Lord. And so I'm not wanting to give you laws that are just check marks for you to glorify God. That would be useless. But I want to show you principles that if you'll engage with a proper relationship with God, you will please him. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man sows, that shall he also reap. For he that sows to his flesh, let's talk about this idea of flesh. Can anybody give me a definition of the word flesh? Jim? The old nature. The old nature. Good. Anybody else? The word flesh means sarks. Uh, I'm sorry, it is the Greek word sarks. It means the body. It can mean this physical body in the right context. In this context, it isn't necessarily this body. Let me read to you a definition. It's a term that can often in Scripture refer to the physical body. However, it's also a reference to all parts of the body which are dominated by sin to such a degree that wherever flesh is, all sin is likewise present. No good thing can live. It is our sin nature. It is our old man. Man did not start this way. How did man start? In perfect holiness. Adam and Eve, no sin. But when Adam fell into sin, he now created for all of us a struggle between what is right and what is wrong. What is our natural tendency? To go to that which is wrong. That is the flesh. That is the flesh. Those things that are opposed to God's holiness and God's character. Go over to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse number 5. Romans 8, verse 5. For they that are after the, and there's our word, flesh, do mind the things of the flesh. If you are sinful, what is your tendency? You will flock towards sin. But they that after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Now, this is interesting. For to be carnally minded. What is that word carnal? No, Alan, I did not say carmel. And Kevin, I did not say carnival. I said carnal. You know, it's the same word as flesh. It's to be fleshly. You can literally read it this way. For to be fleshly minded is what? Death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the fleshly mind is at enmity against God. He's at war. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. And so you find this term inside this passage that Paul says. Flesh, fleshly, fleshly, flesh. It's all based upon the sinful man opposed to the holiness of God. How do you become spiritual? You oppose the flesh. You reap what you sow. 
And so if you're going to be pursuing after sin and disobedience, do you think that you're going to all of a sudden one day wake up and be spiritually holy? It doesn't work that way. You reap what you sow. Let me illustrate it this way. Did you know that cats cannot have ibuprofen? Never give a cat ibuprofen. When Andy and I were living in Concord prior to the kids being uh, born, we had a cat named Cindy Lou. We kind of named it Cindy Lou. We rescued it from a shelter. It was named Cindy after the youngest child of the Brady Bunch because there were six kids and cats in the litter. Well, that cat, by the way, was probably living proof that demonic possession inside animals was possible. Just, you know, one of those cats. Anyway, um, one day I was taking an ibuprofen and I dropped it on the floor. Couldn't find it. You know why I couldn't find it? Because that cat ate the ibuprofen. To cats, ibuprofen is poison. And so all of a sudden, we looked down at the cat after a few minutes, and its face began to swell. Its jaw started protruding out. It was the weirdest thing. And so we went online and figured out what the issue. It passed in, uh, in a few hours. She was back to normal. She didn't have a big enough dose to do any permanent damage. But for a cat, that ibuprofen, I believe it's the same thing for dogs, is actually a poison to the system. Do you realize spirituality views flesh as the same thing? It's a poison to your system. The two are enemies. If you choose your sin nature over your spiritual nature, you are poisoning your spiritual life. And so some would think, oh, okay. That's just a little poison. It can't be that bad. All right. Who of you tonight would have like a little cyanide poisoning in your sandwich for dinner? Okay, what about, not so drastic, but what a little bit of arsenic? Ah, come on, right? A little lead, a little mercury, just a little asbestos. It won't do you that bad, will it? You reap what you sow. And so if you're going to find yourself in a position where you tolerate and allow the flesh to rule your life, and you're following after your sin nature, you are poisoning your spiritual life. You reap what you sow. Law number two tonight. The law of trash. Yes, I made the law of trash up. But I didn't make this statement up. Garbage in, garbage out. Garbage in, garbage out. Go over to Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15, verses 17 through 20. Jesus says, Don't you understand yet that whatsoever entereth in at the mouth goeth into the belly, and it is cast out into the drop? Is this deep science for you? I'm assuming that most of you tonight, before you got here, had dinner. If not, probably wait and have it afterwards. Some of you may be having dinner right now. I don't know. Some of you may be wishing you had dinner right now. But here's the principle. You open your mouth. You put the food in. You chew it. It goes to your stomach. Your body then digests and sends the right nutrients to where it needs to. And if it doesn't need it, it goes out the way God designed it. That is not that difficult to understand, is it? Now look at verse 18. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands, that doesn't defile a man. What is Jesus' point? 
His whole point is that if you're going to put garbage into your mouth, what should you expect to come out? Garbage. If you're going to feed yourself evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and blasphemies, even though you think you have control over it, what is going to happen in your life? Those exact things. You hear me joke quite often that prior to me having my health issues, my favorite food was what? Doritos. Oh, Doritos. And not just any kind of Doritos. There's Mexican flavored Doritos out west that you can't get around here that are quite spicy and uh, oh, it is just, I think that manna might have been made out of Doritos back in the Old Testament. They're that good. Or Krispy Kreme donuts. I can't decide which one. But anyway, if you are going to eat a non-healthy diet and put that food into your body, what is going to happen to your body? It's going to break down. Now, some of us are willing to gamble on that. Let me just warn you, it will catch up with you, and it's not going to be fun. But spiritually, if you're putting stuff into your life that is sin-based and disgusting and an abomination to the Lord, how can you expect to have a great spiritual life? Proverbs 4, 23 says, Keep your heart with all diligence. Again, this is not the beating organ. It is your mind. It is your inner man. Keep your mind with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. So how do we test that? Well, I've got four questions here very quickly. Number one, what type of music are you consuming and how does it affect your spiritual life? That is a fantastic question, isn't it? Oh, pastor, but when I'm down, I like to listen to something that really gets me even downer. I know that's not a word. I like to wallow in my sorrow. I like to listen to fleshly things that makes me get my mind off things. What is God's command? Come back every other Sunday afternoon and you'll find out. Number two, what types of entertainment do I consume and how do they affect me? I mean, we could spend all night talking about video games, movies, uh, internet usage, magazines, dirt operas, whatever, soap operas. You can go down the list. If you are poisoning your mind with trash... Don't expect to have a great spiritual life. Expect to have it as trash. Garbage in, garbage out. What type of advice do I take? You know, it's really sad that far too many people get their advice from afternoon talk show hosts instead of the Word of God. And they become these popular icons And don't you dare override such and such a person who has their own show because, oh, that's holy ground if you're going to bash them. And what if they decide to not talk about the Bible or they override the Bible? Oh, pastor, don't step on my toes. Or are you looking at the sacred things of God and filling your life with sacred things to get your advice from the Word of God? Number four, what type of friends influence me? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33. Evil companions corrupts good morals. Seen it time and time again. Where young people, adults, older people, no one's immune. Start hanging out with a crowd that has no interest in spiritual things. Now they may not, Christian may not fall into that trap right away, but it is a matter of time. Psalm 1 echoes true. Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. What happens after he's walking in the counsel of a godly? He'll be standing in the way of sinners, and then what? Eventually he'll be sitting in the seat of the scornful. That is the progression. Now I'm not suggesting as a believer we to be isolationists. God has put us into this world for a specific purpose, to be salt and light for him. But you have to understand that friendship with the world is war with our God. And so if you're allowing unrighteous people to affect your behavior, 
they will affect your morals. Garbage in, garbage out. One final law here tonight, the law of starvation. And the law of starvation says this, nothing in, nothing out. Go over to 1 Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2, verse number 1. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that you may be able to grow thereby. If so, be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious, to whom coming is unto a living stone, it's loud indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. You know, while some of us here tonight may be familiar legitimately with hunger, not many of us are familiar with the symptoms of starvation. At the outset, victims are of an insatiable craving for nourishment. And as time passes, however, the body now adapts and weakens. The mind is dulled and it desires nothing to eat. In fact, starving people actually reject food at some point, even if it's placed before them. Mom and I witnessed this to my dad uh, before he passed away. It is a strange principle that someone who is starving will go into utter shutdown until they die. Do you realize that spiritual starvation will follow the same course? If you've been feeding daily on God's word, it is natural for you to be hungry for it because it sustains you. At time, you may notice an interruption. You're no longer a spiritual oneness with God. But you, if you continue to neglect it over and over, you now lose the desire to study and to feast off the word of God. In fact, Many Christians are actually starving themselves to death because they've lost the sweet taste of God's Word. We don't have time to read it tonight, but go through Psalm 119. All of it. It shows you how precious and sweet God's Word actually is. Let me say this. No person's mind can be renewed so that it's pleasing to the Lord if you're starving. Nothing in nothing out. And it's easy to see why summer Christians actually remain powerless and unable to please the Lord in any way, shape, or form because they refuse to eat. And sometimes I think it's very legitimately to say, is that person saved in the first place? Friends, we are to crave and desire the word of God. And if you're going to skip it, you can assuredly know that your mind will starve and not produce any spiritual life. Three thoughts tonight. Three laws. Number one, you reap what you sow. On one of Judson's CDs that he listens to from Patch the Pirate, that's called the Law of the Boomerang. Whatever you do will come right back to you, right? Number two, the law of trash. Garbage in, garbage out. If your Bible has less wear than your TV, you got problems. Number three, the law of starvation. Nothing in, nothing out. You can't just all of a sudden wake up spiritual one day because you're starving. It doesn't work that way. Let me lead you with a quote. I don't know who wrote this quote, but I thought it was fantastic. A well-read Bible is a sign of a well-fed soul. I like that, and it is true. Father, I pray that we tonight would be driven to the text of Scripture, that we would fight our sin nature, that we would be people 
that realize that you want spiritual things put in. And it takes time and effort to be spiritual. But Lord, if we get to a point where we start neglecting, we really need to come and find out what the major root of the problem is. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone tonight that is violating one of these three laws, that you would encourage them and strengthen them this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.